Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here. The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace, the Texas Ranger and Hunter by John C. Duvall, published all the way back in 1871. Now today is episode 12 in this series on Bigfoot Wallace, and in this episode we'll learn about a treaty that he made with the Lipan Apaches, and about another curious specimen. This one is an author from back east who wants to travel with Bigfoot and his rangers. A few months after I had settled on the Medina River, I concluded that it would be good policy to enter into a regular treaty with the Lipans, who at that time occupied all the adjacent country. So I made my preparations for a grand dinner, to which, upon a certain day, I invited all the chiefs, and after I had feasted them to their heart's content on bear meat and honey, and sweetened coffee to which they are exceedingly fond, I broached the subject to them, stating briefly that I was a lone man, and they were a powerful tribe, and that I wanted to make a treaty with them by which they should guarantee never to interfere with me or my stock, so long as I conducted myself peaceably toward them. Whereupon the head chief, Koyolapto Hajo, or literally, smells bad when he walks, rose up from the buffalo robe on which he was sitting, and he made a speech in reply, in which he praised me in the highest terms, saying I was a great warrior and hunter, and a good friend to the Lipans, that I did not have two faces like a great many of the white people, and that therefore they had confidence in me and what I told them that they knew no Lipan had ever come to my ranch and gone away hungry, but that I had always filled their stomachs, patting his own, with fat bear meat and honey, as I had done that day. He then turned to the other chiefs and asked them if they were willing to enter into the treaty I proposed, and they all grunted out their readiness to do so. So the treaty was formally made and ratified, and though the expenses attending to it were much less than the cost of a majority of the treaties made by Uncle Sam, it was probably as faithfully kept at least for a long time. When the chiefs got up to leave, they all shook me by the hand, and told me that henceforth I was just the same as a lipan in their estimation, and that I must steal plenty of horses and cattle, the only mode, as they supposed, of getting them, and that they would never steal them from me, and that no other Indians would dare do so on their hunting grounds. But before the chiefs left, I produced a jug of whiskey in order to clinch the treaty effectually, and told them that they had to take a parting drink with me. From the length of time that smells bad as he walks held the jug to his lips, I think he must have swallowed at least a pint. Indeed, I am certain of it, for before they were out of sight, I saw him charge his mustang over the other chiefs, and go off whooping and yelling like a maniac. Well, for several years the treaty was faithfully kept on both sides, and I never lost a horse or a hoof of any sort, although my neighbors, for after a while several families settled within six or eight miles of me, could not keep an animal on their ranches. But in the course of time, the Lipans concluded to emigrate from that part of the country to the headwaters of the Guadalupe River, and as I had then collected quite a stock of horses and mules around me, the temptation to steal from me was too great to be resisted. And a night or so after the tribe had left, they sent back a party of warriors, who made a clean sweep of everything I had in the shape of a horse on my ranch. At first I did not suspect the Lipans, supposing that the stealing had been done by other Indians, but on following their trail a short distance the next morning, I picked up an arrow which I knew from its peculiar make had belonged to a Lipan, and also the tail of a fox fastened to a carved wooden handle, such as the chiefs of that tribe generally carry with them on all occasions of public ceremony. I was indignant, of course, at being served such a scurvy trick by my old friends and allies, particularly as I had always kept the treaty made with them in good faith myself, and I determined to make them pay dearly for it if I could. So the next morning I went into San Antonio where there was a ranging company station in which I had many old acquaintances, and I told them how the Lipans had served me, and proposed that we should make up a party and follow the Indians and give them a lesson that would teach them that they could not break their solemn treaties with impunity. The captain of the company, who was an old friend of mine, readily consented that any of his men should go with me who desired to do so. 
and about thirty of the right sort volunteered at once, by whom I was unanimously elected commander-in-chief for the expedition. The captain also furnished us with four fine pack mules, and rations enough to last us a month. Just as we were leaving San Antonio for my ranch, an odd-looking customer rode up to me and introduced himself by saying, Captain Wallace, I believe? At your service, sir, I replied. Well, said he, Captain, I have understood you were about starting on a trip into the wilderness, and if you have no objection, I should like to go along with you. I am an author, sir, and now engaged in writing a novel entitled The Wayworn Wanderer of the Western Wilds, and never having as yet been outside of the settlements, I am anxious to accompany you on your trip, in order to acquire some practical information of the subjects to be treated of in it. Well, I replied, Mr. Author, I have not the least objection to your going with us if you wish it, but I will tell you beforehand that you will have a very rough road to travel, and no taverns on the way to put up in at night. Oh, said he, I understand all about that, and if it is agreeable to you, I shall certainly go along. Seeing that it was evidently his intention to go along with us at once, I said to him, Of course, Mr. Author. I have not the least objection in the world to your company, but you surely do not think of starting on such a trip in the dress you have on. He was dressed in a stovepipe hat, light cloth coat and pantaloons, and patent leather gaiter shoes. Just think of a fellow, will you, in that costume, among the chaparrals on the headwaters of the Guadalupe River, one of the roughest little scopes of country in all the borders of Texas. Why, said he, looking down to himself in an admiring sort of way, what is the matter with my dress? Oh, nothing now, I replied, but by the time you get through the first chaparral on the way, you will not have a rag on you big enough to patch a bullet with. And besides, I continued, you ought by all means to have your implements with you. I meant, of course, a rifle and revolver. Oh, I have got them, he said, hauling out of his pocket a portable inkstand and a memorandum book. I always carry them with me. I could not, to save my life, help laughing right out in the fellow's face. It was too ridiculous to think of a man starting out on the warpath without a gun or a pistol or even a butcher knife, with nothing, in fact, except an ink bottle and a memorandum book. My friend, I said... If you are determined to go on this trip, take my advice and go back to San Antonio and get you a gun and a pistol and a buckskin suit of clothes and then join us at my ranch on the Medina where we shall remain until tomorrow evening. Captain, he replied, I reckon you are right and I will go into town and fix up as you advise and then meet you at your ranch at the time appointed provided I can find my way out there. Oh, there will be no trouble about that, I said, and gave him the necessary directions to enable him to find the road. Well, goodbye, Captain, he said. You may look for me to a certainty, for I am resolved to go along with you and pick up all the information I can on the subjects I shall treat of in my great novel of the Wayworn Wanderer of the Western Wilds. All right, Mr. Author, I replied, and I have no doubt you will be able to pick up a good deal before you get back. And with that, he turned his pony and cantered off toward town. I was rather anxious that the fellow should go with us, for it struck me that there was considerable fun to be had out of him, if he was rightly handled, and I hoped what I had told him of the dangers and hardships of the trip would not prevent him from meeting us as he had promised. Sure enough, late in the evening, our author rode up to my ranch dressed in a suit of buckskin with a little double-barreled gun on his shoulder and an umbrella strapped behind his saddle. He came up to me smiling and shook me by the hand. Well, Captain, said he, you see I am up to time and armed and equipped as the law directs. The men gathered around him as he dismounted from his pony to see, as I overheard one of them remark, if they could make out what sort of varmint he was. I am glad to see you, Mr. Author, I said, and in a few days I think I can promise you a little insight into the ways of the wilderness. Hello, stranger, said one of the men, pointing to the umbrella. What's that you got strapped to your saddle there? That, said our author, is what is commonly termed an umbrella, 
and is used as a protection against the sun and rain. Run here, everybody, cried the fellow. Here's a man going on a scout with an umbrella. I'd rather have it, said another, than that bird gun he's got on his shoulder, for if he was to open it suddenly on an Indian, he would run certain, thinking it was some newfangled weapon of the white people. At least I know his horse would. My friend, said I, seeing nothing like a revolver buckled around him, why didn't you bring a pistol with you? Pistol, he answered, rummaging about in his pockets. I have got one somewhere, I know. I wish I may be kicked to death by grasshoppers if he didn't fish up out of his breeches pocket a little pepper box of a thing about the size of the length of my big toe. Here it is, said he, fingering at the trigger as he pulled it out. When pop, it went right off in the midst of the crowd. This frightened or excited our author so much that he kept on pulling the trigger, and bang, bang, it went until all six barrels were emptied, when he dropped it like a hot potato and made tracks for the house. While it was firing off, the men dodged behind everything that was handy. Some of them, hallooing, hobble the thing, rope it, pinch it into the creek, etc. Fortunately, there was no one hit which was a wonder, for things of this sort, I have noticed, are apt to hurt somebody when they go off accidentally, but you cannot strike the side of a house with them at ten paces when you shoot at it on purpose. The men were tickled to death with our author, and some of them proposed having him out of the house again for further amusement, but I objected to this, and told them that he belonged to me, for I had found him first and that it would not do to use him too extravagantly, for fear he wouldn't last us the trip through. They thought that this was reasonable enough, and let him alone for the balance of the night. So that's the end of this story. This is episode 12 of my series on Bigfoot Wallace, and this episode is the start of a new adventure for Bigfoot, where he'll try to find the Lipans who stole his horses, while being accompanied by this author. So we'll see what happens next with Bigfoot and the author in the next episode. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.